I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Colombia, beautiful Medellin, it's wonderful. Wow. I'm, uh, you know, when, they, when I got invited to do this, I was like, well, my, my good friend Kate has been living here and she just talks about how wonderful and beautiful her, her mountain ho home is and I've just heard so many things and so how could I say no? How could I say no? Uh, let's have a huge round of applause for the organizers and the volunteers for the conference. It's been amazing, <laughs> really, bravo. Bravo to all of you. So, all right, this talk is called The Elements of Scaling. Um, and so, okay, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> I'm gonna forget which hand is which. Uh, okay, so scaling. What do we think of when we think of scaling? So this is actually, you know, I, I've done a lot of scaling in my day. I've scaled systems, a lot of code and software systems. I'm a distributed systems infrastructure developer by training. Um, but for the last few years, as I was the CTO of Rent the Runway, I learned how to scale teams. And when a lot of people think of scaling teams, they answer the question, how do I scale teams with, oh, well, you just hire a bunch of 10x developers, right? You hire these mythical, magical 10x developers who will just get so much done that you know, you just only have to hire a handful of them and anytime you need to hire another person, just make sure they're a 10x developer before you hire them. Well, that's not generally very realistic, right? Unfortunately, if 10x developers exist, which I'm not sure that they do, they're very rare, they're very situationally dependent. A person who's a 10x developer in one company, in one team, in one language, is probably not gonna be that 10x developer in other places, right? It's not like you just are or you aren't. Um, but it's much easier to find people and grow people who are able to make everyone around them a little bit more productive and thus create that kind of 10x impact by improving everyone around them. And yes, this does apply to managers and I'm gonna talk a lot about management and leadership stuff because that's what I've been doing and I realize that's not necessarily relevant to everyone here. But hopefully you'll still get something out of this because even if you're not a manager, you all have the potential to be a leader, right? When you interact with other people, you have the chance to influence them, to make their lives better, to make their lives worse. Um, if, you have a, if you're a manager, you have a lot of opportunities to influence them and mostly to make their lives worse. Uh, some quotes about leadership and management to get us started. The key to being a good manager is keeping the people who hate you away from those who are still undecided. <laughs> That is by someone named Casey Stengel. Uh, you do not lead people, lead by hitting people over the head. That's assault, not leadership. Dwight Eisenhower said that. Okay, so who am I? Why am I here? Why am I talking to you? I'm not a Ruby developer, I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed to admit. You're getting a brain break in this talk. You know, you've learned so much. If I tried to teach you a bunch of things about Ruby, you'd all, you know, your brains would start leaking out of your ears, right? <laughs> so it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So, so instead, you know, I'm a CTO, or I was up until about a year ago. I've been taking the last year to give talks like this. I'm writing a book. I am on various committees for various things. I teach an engineering management class program thing sometimes. Um, but, you know, long ago and far, far away, I was a software developer like most of you in this room. I started my career, I actually have computer science degrees, so that's the way I came into things. Um, but I started my career really as an infrastructure software developer in finance was really where I did most of my work. And I was uh, building big distributed systems in Java, I'm sorry, I know. Um, <laughs> In Java, in finance, uh, for a very long time, I became a tech lead. I learned how to manage small teams. Um, but what happened to me was several years into that, I realized that I liked my job in some ways. I was still working on big, interesting, hard projects, and I was learning a lot. But you know, the, the problem that I was having was that I didn't feel like I could have a big impact. That I felt that I was really limited because I was more of an architect and I wasn't managing teams, I wasn't able to lead people. So I had to lead entirely by influence and at really big companies that just means you play a lot of politics, right? You get to know people, you have to convince a whole bunch of people who have no reason to want to listen to you or to do anything that you suggest. You have to convince them to do it and that was really tired and I figured, you know what? I can do better, I can be an awesome manager. So I went into a startup. I went to a little startup called Rent the Runway. 
Rent the Runway rents designer dresses and accessories, such as this lovely dress that I'm wearing here. Um, rent the Runway was about two years old when I joined, and I went to a startup because, you know, that's what you do when you're at a big company and you feel like you don't have enough power over people. You go to a tiny company where you can pretend to be a little petty dictator. Um, so I went to Rent the Runway, and I actually did not join. I was not the co-founder. Some people think that I was the co-founder or the CTO from the get-go. I was not. I was a director of infrastructure engineering. Really what that meant was I was leading a big systems rewrite, still in Java, I'm sorry, but we did end up using some Ruby. Also, we did a big systems rewrite. The, the systems of Rent the Runway were originally written in Drupal PHP. Uh, PHP, definitely worse than Ruby, 100%. Um, so we, were, we had this awful Drupal PHP system, and we were moving that into Java services, which is what I was leading. And then eventually, we actually then fronted that with a Ruby API layer that was serving the website. So I was hired to lead the team, to lead the architecture, to do that. To give you a sense of what I am like, as a manager, as a hands-on manager. Uh, somebody asked me today, you know, should I, uh, you know, I've got a few developers now, and we don't have that much tests, and I don't know, does it slow us down? Well, this is my answer. Uh, if you do not test your commits, I will bury you. I'm very particular about style, especially at the time when I had never worked for a small company or a startup. I'd only worked for big companies where you have the rules and you follow those rules. So. I'm leading a team. I'm writing a bunch of code. I'm stressed out, but having a good time. I'm learning the startup thing, you know? And it was pretty cool, actually. I was having a good time. And it's all going along. And then all of a sudden, my team, my company, has what I would call a cultural seg fault. My boss, the person who hired me, was the then VP of engineering, leaves. And he had hired most of the people on the team. So the team was about 15 engineers, 15 to 20 at the time. He had hired most of us. There was no one to take over for him. And you know, I had a choice. I could leave or I could stay. And I decided, hey, you know what? This is why I came to a startup, so I could take power, take <laughs> over the team, own everything. So I raised my hand and I said, hey, boss, I can do it. Put me in. I'm charming. I'm smart. I'm the most experienced person right now who wants to manage on this team, so you should just let me run it. And lacking any better options at the time, they said, fine, OK. You can be the interim head of engineering while we try to hire a CTO or someone else. So I took the job. Uh, and it was really hard. Turns out, managing like a whole company worth of engineers, even if it's only like 15 or 20, is way, way harder than managing even a large team. Right? All that time that I wanted to spend coding and debugging, I just didn't have as much time to do it anymore. I was stressed out. I happened to be also pregnant with my first child, my first and only child. That was probably not making anything easier for me. Uh, it was a really stressful time. And so, you know, maybe it shouldn't be a surprise, but a few months into my job, to my time, I get my very first review from the CEO as this interim head of technology. And she tells me, that I was creating a culture of fear. <laughs> oh my gosh, having problems, there we go. Culture of fear. This is the problem with the double, uh, the double flinkers here. Yes, I was creating a culture of fear. So this is not a thing that you want to hear. I'm going to go ahead and guess You know, if any of you have, have gotten a really bad review at work before. I'm sure they said good things, by the way. But it was a shocking thing to hear. I did not want to hear that my team was afraid of me, that they were, you know, that they were afraid to make mistakes in front of me. They were afraid of what I would say if they took a risk and failed. So this was really a wake-up call for me. This was a huge wake-up call. I realized that you know, the call was coming from inside the house. I needed to change. The only person who could change and make the situation better was me. And that was important because I knew that I wanted and needed, really, to create a culture of trust. I spent the next three years after I got that review working really, really hard to figure out how do I create a culture of trust? How do I regain the trust of the people that are on the team? How do I hire new people in and help them grow and help them trust one another? Because, you know, at the end of the day, what I was trying to do is I was trying to scale. I was trying to scale a team. And scaling, it turns out, whether you're scaling systems or people, 
The challenge of scaling is always in coordination and communication. So any of you who are distributed systems developers, or if you become distributed systems developers, you will learn this rule, right, that the problem, the challenge of scaling is any time your systems have to communicate with one another, all of a sudden you get to these bandwidth bottlenecks, right? Oh, managing and scaling teams is the same way. Any time you have to put in communication or coordination to make sure people are doing the right thing, that they're getting on the same page, you end up in these bottlenecks. So, so this is a talk about some of the things that I learned in the process of growing and scaling this team. I'm going to try to make them applicable to all of you, whether you are brand new to software development or whether you are old crusty CTOs like me or anywhere in between. And we're going to start, though, with the most easy one to explain to everyone, which is speed. Moving fast. Moving fast and breaking things. Maybe not breaking things, but certainly moving fast. This is the most straightforward thing for me to explain to all of you as software developers, because probably you like to move fast. You like to write code quickly. You like to you know, get things done and move quickly. Um, something that happens, though, to, as you become managers and go sort of move up is that you start to uh, break off these big projects. And you're like, well, they have all these complexities. And you start to slow things down. And you, know, you slow things down because you know so much and that you don't ship code very much. And in fact, this is the reason that many people in management and CTO positions get fired. <laughs> so speed is really important. Um, and I mentioned that when I uh, joined Rent the Runway, it was because we were doing this big rewrite out of Drupal PHP uh, and into Java services and a Ruby front end. Well, I have a whole talk on rewrites. If you like to think about rewrites, uh, you can find it online. Um, but one of the big lessons we learned is actually on the Ruby side of it. We did this thing where we were trying to be you know, smart and future oriented. And we tried to create these things called swim lanes where different parts of the website, of the storefront website, like, would be independently developed and independently deployable. And you know, we would de deploy them on different clouds. Well, this was the result which was, you don't even need to read the words, because the words don't matter, but just the connections, right? Everything depends on everything else. It was a total mess. So we knew this was a mess. We over-engineered. We had Git submodules. That's a bad sign. Ooh, yeah. So you know, we knew this was a mess. And it was taking, the, the big result of this mess was that it took like four hours to deploy the storefront code base. We are an e-commerce website. Deploying the storefront is how our customers see changes. By and large, that's one of the most important things that we did. So we were only doing it once a week, and it took about four hours. And we all knew this was a problem. So we decided to rub some DevOps on it and make it DevOpsy, right? We were going to automate it. We spent the team away to make it faster, to put some automation in, to clean up those Git, Git messes that we had, get rid of those submodules, give up on this magical idea of you know, full failure tolerance and independence, because we didn't need it. We had plenty of single points of failure. Why try to make this not one of them? Who cares? Um, and so towards the end of that exercise, I said to the team, hey, you know what? How about instead of just uh, making it faster to deploy, because that's good, but we make it so that we can deploy every day. So we didn't go all the way to continuous deployment, which is sort of the, the beautiful dream where every change just sort of automatically goes out as soon as it's ready. But we did get it to the state where we could deploy every day. We had to add some feature toggling and change a little bit of the workflow. And it was magical. The impact, the positive impact on the culture of the team from this engineering process change that, yes, required some coding, was awesome. Engineers like to ship. All of you, I hope, I bet, actually, I would, I would strongly bet, all of you want to be able to go to work every day and say yes to the question, do I have the opportunity to do what I did best today? Right? Today, I got to do the thing that I do best. And I'm going to guess that for most of you, the thing that you do best is not spending four hours releasing code. Right? That's, you want to be writing Ruby. You want to be making features. You want to be fixing bugs. You don't want to be wrangling with release scripts and releasing a website. By making it faster for the engineers to do what they love to do, all of a sudden, everyone was happier. Another thing happened, which was that all of a sudden, people had a lot more autonomy. Because when you only release once a week, what happens is the following common tale. I'm about to cut the release branch. Oh, just give me 15 more minutes. I have this one more change to go in. Fine. 
30 minutes later, the change is in, they've broken the build. Oh, just give me another 15 minutes to fix the build. Fine. Two hours later, you're finally going to get started on that four hour long release process. And oh, hey, guess what? We have a problem. We need to roll back. And now we're not going to do it for another week. Or I'm going to have to go through this day long process again tomorrow. It's terrible, right? That's terrible. And that means that you, as the person doing the release, really don't want Jane, who wants to get her last minute change in, you don't want to give her that opportunity. But Jane really needs to get that in because her product manager is breathing down her neck to get that change released. So now you're, you're competing with one another. You've created an us versus them uh, environment. That's not trust. That's the opposite of trust. By enabling autonomy and removing this coordination, now, all of a sudden, people are happier. And they work better together. And they're much less likely to argue over getting things into the release. Because guess what? If you miss today, you can do it tomorrow. OK, so takeaway for all of you. Whether you are managers or individual contributors or anywhere in between, be impatient. Don't just let you know, bad processes sit out there and slow you down day after day after day. If you notice these things, try to figure out a way to make them better. That doesn't mean they have to be perfect. right? Sometimes people fail in this by saying, well, if we're not all the way to continuous deployment, then we're nothing. But no. Deploying every day is way better than deploying once a week. And once a week is better than deploying once a month. Right? It's, a continuum. it's a continuum. But be impatient and look for opportunities to make the process better for everyone. OK. I have no idea how much time I've taken so far. Uh, well, OK, I'm going a little slow. So I'm going to move. I'm going to speed up. Structure. Oh, yeah, everybody hates structure. Right? <laughs> structure is awful. So maybe, maybe I mean learning or transparency, because we like those words. Most of us don't like the word structure. Um, engineers at startup, startup people in general, when they're asked to describe the word structure, talk about it like, like it's poison. It's innovation crushing is one word apparently people use. All right, well, look, the thing about structure is that it's inevitable. Structure happens, right? Uh, when you, if I were to give you 50,000 lines of spaghetti Ruby code, and I were to say, hey, well, here's, what, here's your task. You're going to have a team of five, and they all need to work on this code base. What would you do? Probably, hopefully, you would refactor it maybe, add some tests, add some documentation, whatever, right? You would add structure. Structure is not good or bad. It is neutral. It is what helps us get to the what is important to do right now quickly, right? That is the purpose of structure, and that's why structure happens. But the challenge is that so often, we don't really understand why structures have come to be. Right? So you see them, and you're like, why do I have to fill out this form? And I, why do I have to do this thing? And it's slowing me down, and it's annoying me. And I don't understand this structure because it was built up over time a long time ago. Right? In a small company especially, and in a tech team and anywhere else, though, structure does tend to come from learning from lessons in the past. Right? When something goes wrong, you learn from that mistake, and you tend to put in structures to accommodate that lesson. That's kind of the, the nature of structure. It just goes wrong when you don't do that with any transparency, when it's just arbitrary. When HR comes in from the side, or finance comes in from the side and says, here's a rule that you now have to follow, and you don't understand why you have to follow it. This is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, this is a bridge, a famous bridge that collapsed, a structural failure in the United States. Um, and it only stood for like a few weeks. But they didn't just tear the bridge down and say, well, this structure failed, so I guess we shouldn't have structure anymore. No, of course not. You know, they didn't just expect people to kayak across the river. No, they built a new bridge. They learned from that structural failure. And they put those lessons into building this bridge, and I'm sure bridges all over the world also learned from the lessons of this structural failure. So structure, again, even when it fails, is not necessarily a bad thing. So I have one very well-known structure for actually around the world, although I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this. I wrote an engineering career ladder at Rent the Runway. What is an engineering career ladder? Engineer one, engineer two, senior engineer. It's the levels of your career if you progress along a career path, right? Um, and that structure came from failure. We had no career ladder for a long time. And when I joined, we had none. And we kind of had a bunch of people with random titles, and they were paid random amounts of money. And when we hired, we just sort of like hired, we were like, oh, this person seems pretty good, so we'll hire them. So the HR team at some point was like, hey, you know, it's probably a good idea 
to have titles to some extent, to be able to pay people fairly, to know what we're hiring for. So I went away and asked a buddy of mine for his engineering ladder. He was at a startup. And uh, he gave it to me. And I basically used it. I tweaked it a little bit. And this is just like an example of that. Very little detail. Um, good levels. Lots of, there's more, way more to it than this. But you know, every level had like just a couple sentences of description for what it meant to be at that level. And so I took this ladder and I rolled it out to my team. And my hope was that people wouldn't get obsessed with their title because there's just not that much details, right? So why do you really care, right? It's, it's meaningless, right? Well, uh, actually, it turns out that made people way more obsessed with their titles. That made them way more stressed out. Uh, ambiguity is a bias vector. That's something that my friend Kate, who you saw earlier, likes to say. And I agree with her. And this is a great example of that. It's somewhat ambiguous. So I went away and came up with something that looks more like this. And I'm not going to leave this up there because that's a lot of text. But what, we what I did was I went away not just by myself. I took a bunch of the other senior people on the team, and we created something together. right? So it wasn't just me going away, coming down from on high, and delivering this structure to people. It was a group effort. People started to understand where the structure was coming from in the first place. And the additional details meant that they had a lot more transparency and understanding of what it meant. right? Learning from these failures. We had the structure. It failed. It failed twice. And we learned from those failures and ended up with something that I'm so proud of that people still use as a jumping off point for creating their own career ladders around the world. So what does this mean for all of you? How can you do this, right? Whether you are, again, a new engineer all the way through to a senior executive. Well, you all have chances to learn. So the learning review is the new, uh, the new popular way of calling of the term for the blameless postmortem, if you've heard of that, or just the postmortem. The goal is that when something fails, when you have a big outage in production, when the code base goes down, or the database goes down, or you accidentally don't charge people, and you say that you did, and everything is fine, right? When big problems happen, you go away, you fix it first, <laughs> and then you take the team together, and you say, how can we learn from this? What happened? When the goal is not to blame someone, the goal is not to be like, oh, Juan, you screwed up, buddy. What were you thinking? Oh my god, one equal sign instead of double equal sign? I mean, come on. I don't, does Ruby have double equal signs? I'm not. Anyway, uh, that, that, that might be a JavaScript joke, maybe. Uh, so you know, the goal is not to point fingers. The goal is to understand that we work in a context where lots of things are going on. Yes, Juan screwed up. Juan also didn't have a code review from anyone, right? Uh, maybe Juan was really tired, and he shouldn't have been working, but he felt like he just had to get this change out. Maybe you know, somebody else didn't notice it for 10 hours because, you know what, they, they're, they were really busy on some other project, and so they weren't paying attention to the logs. But there's always a lot of things that come out of failure. And when you have failure, you have the opportunity to interrogate structure and learn. The goal of good structure, one last point, is that it helps you understand what to do, not specifically how to do it. Good structures are not checklists that you follow, but they're general guidelines and guiding principles. OK, let's see. All right, relatedness. Now we're getting a little touchy-feely. What is relatedness? Relatedness is feeling of belonging, feeling of belonging in a team, of belonging in a group, right? When you feel like people care about you as a human. I'm not always very good at relatedness. Um, when I was an individual contributor, I was really good at being very focused, which meant I didn't go to coffee, I didn't go to lunches, I didn't really do a lot of chit chat. Uh, and that was OK, because I only had to work with like five people, and they eventually got to know me. But when I became a manager, that focus meant that I started every meeting like I was grilling everyone around me all the time. I spent no time getting to know people, no time treating them like human beings. And that is a problem, because Relatedness, that feeling of belonging in a group, is one of the core elements of building strong teams. When you feel like people care about you, guess what? You're willing to make mistakes in front of them. Remember that culture of fear? If they thought that I cared about them, they might have been willing to make more mistakes in front of me. They might have felt more psychological safety. So that diagram on my left, on your right, maybe, I think, uh, is, is a set of things that Google observed when they observed their best, most high-performing teams. 
they went through and they did all these studies, right? And whether Google, you know, is, has, you know, a unique monopoly on high-performing teams, I'd rather doubt it, but I think that this is good advice, or the most fundamental component of high-performing teams is that they feel safe to make mistakes around one another. They feel safe to ask questions. That's why we want to build up this relatedness so that we care about one another. This triangle thing, pyramid, is from the five dysfunctions of the team. Five dysfunctions of a team is a famous like management fable book. And the baseline dysfunction here is absence of trust. When you are afraid that your colleagues are not going to you're not going to act in good faith. They're, that they're going to you know, try to like, tell you things that maybe aren't true, or they're going to question your motives, and you question their motives for doing things. You don't believe that they're doing them for the best of the team or the best of the company, but for some other reason. It's very hard to build up trust and build up healthy teams. So how do we make this better? Well, first things first, we learn how to apologize. Uh, but somehow apologizing is something that many people grow to adulthood not knowing how to do. It's very easy. When you make a mistake, when you hurt someone's feelings, when you act in a way that feels bad and you know it feels bad, and even when you don't know it feels bad, but when you can kind of tell it feels bad, apologize for the action. I'm sorry, I screwed up, I made a mistake. I, the person, did a thing. And I apologize. I'm not sorry for your feelings. That's not an apology, right? I'm sorry that I have hurt your feelings, because you have. Apologize, learn how to apologize simply and move on. If you are a leader, apologizing shows people that making mistakes is not shameful. And that's really good, because you want your team to make mistakes. A team cannot move fast without making mistakes, right? And again, this is about scaling. You want to scale, you want people to be able to push themselves to their limit, and occasionally they're going to make mistakes. So they need to be able to feel like making mistakes is not a shameful thing. Kate, real, I'm, I'm going to spend very little time on this one because I think that it's very convenient for me that Kate just gave her talk on interviewing. Um, because I could replace this slide with the interview. When you ha are in a position of any kind of power, and that includes when you are an interviewer talking to someone, take time in the beginning to just ask the person a little bit about how they're doing, how their day is, especially if it's a relationship that you have ongoing with your team. You know, how's your family or your dog or your marathon or whatever it is that you care about, you, that you know they care about. Build that bond of connectedness just briefly, just enough to let them know that you actually do kind of want to hear from them about them as a person before jumping into business, right? This, again, Starts to, fill, starts to create that relatedness. And why do we create relatedness? Last but not least, conflict. OK, so this might be very culturally specific. American companies seem to have a problem with conflict. Um, a lot of them seem to be really afraid of conflict. They don't want people to disagree with one another. But the problem is that you need conflict. Conflict is how you draw data into the open. Right? When I disagree with you and we start to explain our positions to one another, we both have the opportunity to learn. So conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. Well, except, <laughs> so my nickname at work <laughs> was the hammer. One of my nicknames at work was the hammer. Um, and that is, in fact, the fitness hammer, a very large, heavy fitness hammer that my team got me as a going away gift. Uh, so. Clearly, I don't have a fear of conflict. I'm very willing to come into any kind of discussion and state my point very, very clearly. You will not be mistaken. Now, I actually do change my mind, but that doesn't make it any less intimidating when you report to me to have to hear that from me. right? So perhaps engaging in too much conflict is also not a great thing. So we have built our relatedness so that we trust each other, and we're going to whether we hate conflict or love conflict, we're going to try to replace it a little bit with curiosity. When you detect that you disagree with someone about something important, don't just push it aside and don't just immediately go into attack mode, but try to actually genuinely engage with them. Ask them why. Be curious, right? Seek out their opinions. People love to feel like their opinions matter. That's really important. The ultimate goal of all of this is that you should not be having boring meetings. I freaking hate 
boring meetings, but I love good meetings. If your company sounds like this, a meeting consists of a group of people who have little to say until after the meeting, right? If that is what meetings are to your company, that's a problem because meetings are your most high bandwidth communication opportunity. Whether you're all in the same room, whether you're on the phone or on, you know, uh, uh, camera, camera meeting, voice, I'm just like losing my mind. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Video conference, there we go. Uh, whatever, right? The point of meetings is that your full attention, full attention is on the meeting. And if the meeting is boring, it's not going to be on the meeting. You're going to be like, oh, what's going on in Twitter? Oh, what's going on in Reddit? Like, what? I'm going to just do this code review real quick. I really need to get it done, right? Boring meetings are a waste of time, and they're a waste of the most valuable, precious resource to scaling that there is, which is communication of humans. So when you've built up trust and you've built up healthy conflict on your team, use that to guide meetings that are not too frequent, because obviously another reason you have boring meetings is that you have too many of them. But you don't want to have no meetings. You want to have meetings where people have a chance to really discuss things, to really dig into the meat of things. OK, so now I have mostly finished. And I just need some water. I always get really dry through it when I talk, in case you're wondering whether I'm nervous. <sighs> Summary, move fast. You, if you take nothing away from this talk because most of it's irrelevant to you, fine. But if you are a software developer, you should care about how to make your engineering processes better. There are always so many opportunities for growth in this area. Very, very few companies have great engineering processes. Most of them have terrible to really, really terrible ones. <laughs> right? So look for those opportunities to make shipping easier, because that makes everyone happier. Structure is not good. It's not bad. It's kind of neutral. It helps you get to what should be done more quickly. But be really transparent when you go put structure in. Right? Be really transparent about the things that you're learning, especially when you're learning from failure. Practice relating to your colleagues as humans, because they are, and because that's important for building good teams. And frankly, it's important for having joy at work. And don't settle for an environment where you feel like you can't ask questions. You know what? Software engineers are a very, very valuable resource at all companies. And frankly, I don't care if you're a janitor. I think that people in companies deserve to be heard and treat, like, treated like humans. And so you want to be on a team where you feel like you can have opinions and you can discuss them respectfully, right? but still be heard. Oops, forgot about that. If we are willing to stand fully in our own shoes and never give up on ourselves, then we will be able to put ourselves in the shoes of others and never give up on them. And that is a quote by Pema Chodron, and I, I end this talk with this quote and with one more because I believe that you know, one of the most important things that I had to learn about leadership to really get good at it, to really build these great teams, was how to really fully be comfortable with myself, how to forgive myself when I made mistakes, how to be less hard on myself, um, and then to really give that trust out, not just to myself, but to my whole team, right? To build that culture of trust. That was essential. Empathy is a learnable skill. Um, remember how I said that like, I was really good at being efficient? Well, you know, what happened when I started asking people about their lives and asking people about their days and their families and their pets and their marathons and their movies, whatever they were interested in, was that I started to care about them more. And they started to care about me more. It was like an amazing life hack experience. It doesn't take much. It just takes asking, often is all you need to do, to start to care about other people. And frankly, what's the point in scaling and scaling your company or your team or your software or anything else if you hate the people you have to go to work with every day? And with that, I thank you all very much. I'm writing a book. Please buy it whenever it comes out, although it will be in English, so that might be useful. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you.